Our next speaker is Justin Su, who will be talking about dual queries. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Um, okay, this is joint work with some people from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so the, the basic setting is pretty simple, where we have an analyst on the left, and we have a database full of private data. And this analyst wants to answer a bunch of queries on this data. Uh, however, this database is private, so he wants to make sure that the answers that he gets uh, don't reveal too much about any individual in the database. Okay, so by privacy, I mean, of course, differential privacy, which we've heard a lot about today already. Um, so this is kind of the sketch of what differential privacy is. Uh, we have a randomized algorithm in the middle, and it takes in a database's input and has some output range. So the privacy guarantee should be that if we change a single record in the input, then the kind of the distribution and outputs should be nearly the same. Okay. Uh, so once again, here's uh, the formal definition, which I'm not going to go through. Um, it's some useful properties like we've already heard about. Um, so jumping to our problem. Um, we, we study a very well-known problem, which is the query release problem. So we suppose that we have a space of possible records. Uh, we, we call this x. And for now, we'll think there are just d binary attributes. So each individual's record is a bit string of length d. Um, our database will be a collection of n of these records, uh, which we <coughs> represent as kind of like a histogram. And the analysts want an accurate answers to a large uh, collection of queries. Uh, we're going to call this collection of queries q. And these queries will be counting queries. So these are queries of the form, uh, what fraction of the database satisfies some property p? Or say p is, say, uh, people above 50 or something like that. Um, so our goal will be to privately construct uh, kind of an approximate database d hat, which will approximate d, and then use this approximate database d hat to answer these queries. OK? Um, so there are many approaches to solving this problem. Um, I'm going to focus in this talk on uh, approaches from learning theory, uh, but there are many other approaches. Um, so two algorithms uh, that I want to focus on are, are one by Dwork, Rothbun, and Badhan, uh, which they give query release via boosting, and a different algorithm uh, via uh, Hart and Rothbun, who give a multiplicative weights-based algorithm for releasing answers to these queries. So this second um, algorithm has been evaluated experimentally by Hart, Leggett, and McSherry, and it performs pretty well when the number of binary attributes is not too big. So kind of what is the bottleneck? Well, this second algorithm, algorithm operates on distributions over all the possible records. So we can see that when the number of attributes gets a little too big, say for a number of attributes is bigger than 100, um, the number of records uh, gets really enormous. So for more than 100 attributes, we have something like 10 to the 30 records. And this becomes quickly intractable. Okay, so the question is, is it possible to do better uh, kind of adapting these algorithms uh, to, do, to get around this bottleneck? Um, unfortunately, in general, the, the answer is no. Uh, so there's a collection of very nice uh, impossibility results showing that kind of this exponentially large collection of queries, we cannot hope to answer it accurately and efficiently uh, in general. Um, so that's kind of disappointing. Um, so our, our work can be seen as kind of reconfiguring some of these existing algorithms in order to, to isolate this hard step. And this hard step, we want to kind of pull it out of the algorithm so that we can apply existing constraint-solving technology uh, on this problem. I mean, this, this hard step is really theoretically hard, um, but there's been lots of solvers that have been de developed to kind of solve these problems uh, pretty well in practice, so we can see how well we might hope to perform. Okay, so today, a uh, brief outline. I'm first going to talk about uh, the query release as a zero-sum game to kind of give some motivation of what our algorithm is doing. Next, I'm going to talk about what the equilibrium of this game is and what that might mean for query release. Um, I'll give our query release algorithm third. And finally, I'll talk quickly about some really, really preliminary performance numbers. Okay, so to define the query release game, we'll first define these two players. Uh, we have a data player and a query player. The data player has actions corresponding to records, uh, possible records. And the query player has actions corresponding to queries in this class Q that we want to answer. OK, so to define the payoffs, uh, if we suppose that one player plays R and the other player plays Q, um, this will be the payoff, this quantity Q of R minus Q of D. And the data player is trying to minimize this quantity, and the query player tries to maximize this quantity. So it's a zero-sum game. So this might seem pretty complicated, but for some intuition, uh, we could think about um, the data player's actions as kind of databases with a single record. So the record R is just 
can be thought of as a database with just the record R. The query player Q is intuitively kind of trying to play queries with high error. Um, and this payoff here kind of is the error, because here D is the true database. So this is kind of the error of the approximation R on this query Q compared to the true database. Um, so the data player is trying, in some sense, to find a good database that approximates the true database. Um, now, it's a very natural idea to kind of look at what happens at the equilibrium of this game. So first, to kind of define what equilibrium means, I'll just say that, say the data player has a distribution d hat and over the records, and the query player has a distribution q hat over the queries. Uh, we'll say we're kind of at an approximate equilibrium if neither player can gain more than alpha by playing another distribution. <coughs> so what does this mean for query release? Uh, we know that there's kind of a, a true database, like a perfect database. So if this data player is playing this true database, uh, he expects zero loss or zero payoff because the error on any query is going to be ex zero in expectation. So what we can say is that if we're kind of at this approximate equilibrium, the, the data player's strategy must kind of answer all the queries in Q with error at most alpha. And this is very good because this is exactly what we want uh, for query release. So our goal will be to kind of compute this equilibrium in a private way. Uh, so I don't really want to get into too many details of how we actually do this. I'll just sketch out a very high level um, kind of two approaches uh, to construct this equilibrium. Um, the primal approach, uh, we kind of manipulate a candidate database over all the records X. Um, this is a very well-studied idea. Um, and the optimization problem will be to find a query in Q with high error. Um, kind of a dual approach, which is kind of playing the same game, but from a different point of view, um, we're going to manipulate a distribution over queries Q, and we're going to try to find a record in the possible record space uh, with low error on this distribution over queries. And this is also a very well-studied approach. Um, kind of qualitatively, we want to think about this distribution over records as being, uh, this is kind of a very big distribution. Um, the space of possible records is very large, so this problem like maintaining this or manipulating this, this candidate database is very expensive and is intractable. Um, this optimization problem, on the other hand, we like to think about the query class as being big but not exponentially big. So we're, we'll be happy running in time, say, linear in the number of queries. Uh, so in that sense, we think of this optimization problem as small and being somewhat tractable. Uh, this dual approach uh, is kind of the, the flipped around uh, version. So we have the distribution now to manipulate it is is relatively easy because there's not that many queries. So this is a small and tractable thing. However, this optimization problem becomes hard because there's a large space of possible records and we kind of want to search through the records to find a record with low error. Um, so we kind of switched around the two uh, points of view. Uh, so I want to focus on uh, this step here, this optimization problem here, um, to see like how, really how intractable is it and what exactly is going on. Yep. You're okay with running time, which is proportional. Yes, right. yes. That's right. Okay. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the, the dual optimization problem. So the main task is we will we will sample queries from our query distribution called the Q1 through QS. And we need to do this for privacy, um, which I'm not going to talk about too much. But let's just say that we're given these queries Q1 through QS. And what we want to do now is want to fit find a record that minimizes the average error uh, over these queries. So that's just this quantity here. You can see that each term here is kind of the, the error. See, this is the error on query QS of R. Um, however, we note that kind of this database D here is fixed. It's not really part of the optimization, so we can, uh, this is really equivalent to solving this problem now. And this problem we'll see is just really a pure optimization problem. So it might, the particular form might depend on what these queries are, but this is just a really standard optimization problem. There are no privacy concerns at all here anymore. So we're free to use whatever constraint solving technology we want to solve this problem. OK? Um, so just some, some theorems. Um, our dual query algorithm does, does satisfy differential privacy. Um, also, it has an accuracy guarantee. So with high probability, we'll answer all the queries with uh, error alpha. Where alpha is like this quantity. I want to stress that this error is not uh, state of the art. There's better algorithms that have better known guarantees. However, the strength of our approach is that we've kind of factored our algorithm in a different way so that we can apply different tools to see whether we can get a better performance in practice. But this, this uh, result is nice, but it's not really the best known. For efficiency, um, 
like I said, the optimization problem depends on the specific kind of query. And unfortunately, this step is often hard, so often NP-hard. Um, so, so how do we actually gain if this optimization is hard? It seems like we've kind of traded one problem for another problem, because we still have this hard step. So one big gain is that we manage a smaller distribution. So we kind of maintain that distribution over queries rather than records. So we, we do save if the number of queries, say, is smaller than the number of possible records, which we kind of assume is the typical case. Uh, also, this optimization uh, doesn't involve privacy, so we can use any, any standard solver, and people have developed very good solvers for these kinds of uh, problems. And we can also try to use further heuristics. Um, so for these kinds of optimizations, we kind of give up on the guaranteed accuracy. Uh, we still guarantee privacy, but we can see how well we can perform if we say if the optimization problem is too hard and the solver takes too long, we'll just cut it off and take the best solution we found in the first same minute. Uh, we also try for running for a few rounds or in playing with other parameters. But at always, we always guarantee that the privacy is, is good. Um, so does it perform well? Um, I'm just going to describe some preliminary results. Um, so our database has binary attributes, uh, like I said. Uh, we've tested this on randomly generated data as well as real data. And the queries that we try to answer are these so-called three-way marginal queries. So these are queries of the form, uh, what fraction of the database satisfies A, B, and C? Where you can think of A, B, and C as three attributes. Uh, so the optimization problem for this class of queries is related to max3set. It's not exactly the same as max3set, but it's, it's a variant. So we solve this by encoding this problem as an integer program and feeding into Cplex, which is a very optimized um, <coughs> integer program solver. And we take the best solution found in the first 60 seconds, uh, which we've experimentally ver verified to usually be pretty good. Uh, often we found that Cplex finds a very good solution very quickly, but it takes a very, very long time to prove that it is really the best solution. Uh, but kind of heuristically, it seems to work pretty well. And the hardware is nothing too special. This is kind of just like a medium performance desktop computer. So in principle, you could run this on your laptop, and it should get similar numbers. Uh, so here are some performance numbers. This is for uh, real networking data with about 100 uh, independent binary attributes. This is some kind of packet data. Uh, it's 500,000 records and 500,000 queries. Um, so we find that most of the time we actually spend is not on the optimization step, but it's actually on just evaluating the queries. So this kind of suggests that if we, if we could work more on evaluating, the, evaluating these queries faster, we might be able to gain even better performance. But the performance is already not so bad. So on the left plot here, uh, I'm plotting uh, the average error, which is an additive error, uh, versus epsilon, which is the privacy guarantee. Um, uh, I should note that the average error, not, like trivial error is, is one, because all of our queries answers are between zero and one. So if you have error, error one, then that's really not useful. Uh, but our average error is well below one, all these cases. Uh, we can also plot like, the runtime in minutes. Um, and we, so we, can, we can answer all of these queries in, say, roughly an hour. Uh, so there's a dependence on epsilon because when epsilon gets bigger, we can run for more steps and it takes longer for our algorithm to go. Um, but still seems fairly reasonable. Uh, here's some uh, experiments on randomly biased data. So this is, has a lot more attributes with 2,000 independent binary attributes, uh, 100,000 records and 100,000 queries. And again, here are uh, four, four or five runs of this. And again, here, the, the number, uh, the runtime is a lot lower for this partially because we're having a lot fewer queries. This is the one-fifth number of queries. And since we're maintaining distribution of all the queries, uh, this is much lower runtime. Uh, our accuracy is a little worse, but still, still pretty reasonable. Uh, just wrapping up really quickly, um, I've presented a way to give more practical query release. So the main goal is to kind of handle higher dimensional um, data. And we want to use standard solvers on the hard step. And it seems to perform well in practice, though we really have to run more experiments to really know if we've just gotten lucky so far or not. And some ongoing future work. Um, there's, we can try different solvers as well. And I'm also interested to see how this might scale with the number of attributes, whether we can go to 2,000 or 5,000 or 20,000, maybe. Um, other classes of queries are possible. This will change the optimization problem, uh, but should, in principle, be able to, we can, should be able to do this also. And um, yeah, so, so there might be cases when the optimization problem is easy for certain classes of queries that we haven't found any yet. And there may be other heuristics 
uh, for privacy that we have not considered yet. And that's all. Thanks. Yep. So you're interested in running more experiments. What would be your dream kind of data? What, what, what are the properties of those data? So for accuracy, we really want to have a lot of records, of course, kind of because the sensitivity depends on the number of records. Um, right, so to kind of demonstrate how well this approach works, we kind of want data with a lot of attributes. So that's one thing that we've been struggling with because there's many, there's much real world data with a, kind of um, a lot of attributes, but they're usually not binary, so they're kind of continuous. So we can do something like we can bucket the, the discrete attributes, but then there's a question about how we can discretize these things um, to kind of really give a fair comparison. So we're kind of looking for data which has a lot of really independent attributes and hopefully binary. Uh, that would be and the a best. A lot means? A lot. So at least 2,000 attributes. We can handle 2,000 on random data, so yeah. thousands, maybe even more. Um, Let's take the next question while the next speaker sets up. Yes. So I wanted to ask, is there? Um, to solving this optimization problem exactly, is there a place here for either approximations or for relaxations of the optimization problem? Where yeah, so there definitely is. Um, the way I described it, you had to find an exact optimum, but that's actually not necessary. If you just find an approximate optimum, it's good enough. Um, so like a tool like Cplex, you can get some kind of guarantee about how good your current solution is. There's like a duality gap, but because these problems are hard, you may never close that duality gap. So it may just say, there's a gap that we, we may improve by this much, but it'll just take forever to kind of actually say, no, we actually don't improve by that much. So it's hard to say exactly what approximation we're getting, but that's definitely possible as well. OK? okay. Uh, one last question from Adam. Yeah. So you mentioned that the algorithm, I, um, you had, it's epsilon delta private, but you get this 1 over uh, cube root of n type convergence. Yeah. Is that right? Is it clear that this framework would not give you something more like 1 over squared of n? Um, no, that's not clear to me. Um, I'm not sure that that big. Like, I'm asking, <coughs> say regular multiplicative weights would give you something more like 1 over squared of n with the epsilon delta guarantee, right? Yes. Um, I think it's the sampling step. So we're kind of sampling the queries that we're playing against, so it's a, it's a little bit different. So the privacy loss comes not from adding Laplace noise, but from sampling the queries from the distribution. So I think that's where it comes from, but I, I need to check. So sorry, briefly, the issue is you have to run multiplicative weights to like 1 over alpha squared rounds, but every round you also have to sample 1 over alpha squared queries. The number of private operations you're doing is now like 1 over alpha squared. It's not clear. You can cut down either. You definitely can't cut down the number of steps multiplicative weights rounds for that's the size of the single idea that you get. Hmm. So if you use uh, the Gaussian noise and projection as a subroutine in boosting, then you do get one over root n type. Hmm. Sorry? If you use a Gaussian noise plus a projection onto the polytope as a subroutine for average error instead of uh, and actually get one over root n type dependence in the worst case. <coughs> right. And but, but again, I mean, the issue. So, wait, sorry, what question is that? <laughs> so, using boosting, you can get 1 over root 10 if you just replace the inner subroutine by something slightly different. Well, yeah, I mean, with multiple ways, you can get that. Sure. Okay. So, I guess boosting still has the advantage that you could use the same thing. The inner uh, optimization problem is, is, again, the space complexity is small. So, so, the conceptual difficulty with boosting is you're actually producing a, like, data sets at every point, not just a, a single element. Uh, and the optimization step to create a good synthetic data set is not data independent. Mm -hmm. The gain by doing this is that the optimization step is independent of the private data. Right, right, right. 